and then back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second was like an ox, and the third had a face like a man, the fourth was flying like an eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under his wings. Day and night they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Lord, we praise you. We worship you, O God. We are in such awe of you, Lord, and your saving power. Lord, we ask you this night, Father God, to change us, to wash us with your word, to cleanse us, Father God, of all unrighteousness, to cleanse us, Lord God, of our minds and of our ways, Father God, and bind us to you, Lord God. Bind us to you, Father God, that we would know your heart, we would know your mind, we would have your spirit in us. Wash us clean, Father God. Pour it out upon us this night and forevermore in the name of Yeshua. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Well, you know that old adage, I have good news and I have bad news. Well, I've got good news, but I've got some bad news for you. The good news is, is God has a gift for you. This gift, this gift puts you in such direct communication with God that you'll become his very mouthpiece, his personal navi. Navi means messenger, messenger of God, and we read in the prophets, Navayim, the Navayim were the prophets. The messengers of God, and the very description of Navayim means God's mouthpiece. They are the epitome of thus says the Lord. They are the ones who are anointed to speak on his behalf because of their direct communication with him. Nations hang on every word that you will say. But because you speak the truth, they may despise you. You'll expose the false and the perverse, and they'll plot against you because you speak the truth. And that's the good news. That's the good news about being a Navaim. That's the good news. And here's the bad news. If you misuse this gift, you'll be put to death. Nations will plot against you. People will despise you. People will speak about you and grumble against you. As a Navayim, as a messenger of God with the gift of prophecy, you will be set apart among those who know the Word of God and allow God to speak through you. But every word that comes from your mouth must be from the mouth of God and must serve a purpose in His economy. The gift of prophecy is a powerful gift in God's kingdom. On so many levels, it is so profound and important for this day. Now, many of you have been told that the gift of prophecy is for then. But if that were the case, the coming of Messiah would be old news. We look for the signs and we look for the word from the prophets. Those who can tell us, thus says the Lord. The good news is, is that the gift of prophecy, as all the gifts, are just as alive today as they were the day the Spirit came and became available to all people. The promise in the book of Numbers, the request that Moses made, Lord, I wish that everyone could prophesy. What are you jealous for my sake? I wish that everyone could prophesy. I wish that God would speak through everyone. 
But the gift of prophecy is reserved for those who are willing, willing, willing to be set apart, to be held accountable for every word that comes from their mouth when it comes, thus says the Lord. Tonight, as we continue in our series on the spiritual gifts, we'll talk about the gift of prophecy. A confusing gift, one many people don't understand, but the Bible tells us very specifically about this gift. It speaks maybe more about this gift than any other gift because it's so profound, so life-changing, and nations are transformed by a word of prophecy. Nations transformed. Kingdoms broken. Boundaries changed. Wars won and wars lost. People annihilated and people restored through the gift of prophecy by the spoken word of God. Like all the other gifts, there's a difference between a gift and a talent. And a talent is something that's present from natural birth, but a gift is present only from spiritual birth. Just because you're born means you can have talent. But until you're born again and born of the Spirit, your spiritual gifts are not imparted to you. A talent can communicate on any subject, but a gift communicates biblical truth. And we know the Scriptures, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 4, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them and all men. Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom, to to another the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and He gives them to each one just as He determines. And as we have ventured into this teaching, we begin to understand that our lives in the kingdom of God and the body of Messiah can only be fulfilled when we are fully operating in the gifts God has chosen for us. Why does He choose them for you? I don't know. You have to ask Him why He chose you to have this gift or that gift. It's only for Him to say, not for me to say. If you want to know why, ask Him. But one thing is certain. Whatever gift he's given you, if you are not faithful to that gift, he won't give you another. So in God's economy, everybody has at least one gift. Nobody has all the gifts. But God has entrusted each and every one of you so that you may use it for the uplifting and the encouragement and the unity of the body of Messiah in the congregation. Not in the world at large, not as a lone ranger, not as a freelancer, but in the congregation, the one God has called you to. Wherever you're under your spiritual covering, wherever you're spiritually fed, that's the covering God has for you, and that's where He wants you to operate in your gifts. If your gifts are gifts of helps, then help. If they're gifts of healing, then lay on hands and pray for people and serve in healing. If it's intercession, whatever your gift is, use it for the body of Messiah. He tells us in Romans 12 and 3, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. He's telling us here there are no lesser gifts. The gift of hospitality in this congregation is so essential because we are a fellowship, a body that comes together and breaks bread together, just as it tells us from the very beginning that breaking of bread together is sealed covenants. The breaking of bread changes our relationship with someone. Oh, I can know you in a particular way, but until I've had a meal with you, once I've had a meal with you, we've broken bread together. You'll know about my eating disorder when I wear white shirts and I get spaghetti all over myself. But we're in fellowship when we have food together. When we sit down, it changes things. There are no lesser gifts. Every gift is important, and the congregation can't operate with all, without all the gifts fully operating 
and fully active. And verse 4 tells us, just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Messiah, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, in verse 27 through 31, now you are the body of Messiah, and each one of you is a part of it. And in the congregation, God has appointed first of all apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then workers of miracles, also those having gifts of healing, those able to help others, those with gifts of administration, and those speaking in different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret, but eagerly desire the greater gifts? Now tonight we look at the gift of prophecy. And that is the special ability that God gives to certain members of the body of Messiah to receive and communicate an immediate message from God to His people through a divinely appointed utterance and to reveal truth and proclaim it in a timely and relevant manner for understanding, correction, repentance, or edification. Those are the reasons prophecy is given in the Bible. People with this gift expose sin or deception in others for the purpose of reconciliation, not for condemnation. And when things are exposed by a word of the Lord in prophecy, it is not to condemn is to shed light into a dark corner so that all things are brought out into the light for the purpose of reconciliation. So if someone's in error, it's brought out into the light so that there can be reconciliation. For God is the God of reconciliation. He's called us to a ministry of reconciliation. Therefore, none of the gifts are in opposition to unity. None of the gifts work against the body. All of the gifts work for the body. All of the gifts work for the body. People with this gift speak a timely word from God, causing conviction, repentance, and edification. You know, when we talk about letting things be done in decency and order and the spirit of the prophet being subject to the prophet, those who are head of a congregation who are called to lead a congregation are called to be the prophet. So when a message is given from the pulpit and you say, wow, that rabbi sure reads my mail. Oh, that rabbi really called me out. As well I should. Because if God is going to feed this congregation what this congregation needs, it's going to hit home with as many as possible. Because that is the role of the prophet to step on toes, to mess up shoe shines, to come so close to you that you feel the presence of God, for each one of you to think, wow, I wonder if he's talking about me. Yes, that's exactly what it's supposed to be. And so if somebody brings a word of prophecy, the spirit of the prophet should be subject to the prophet. And if you have a word for this congregation, write it down, pass it forward. And one of the three things should happen to it. The word is confirmed. The word is a not now word, or the word may be wadded up and thrown away. Because that's the way God wants it done. Words come forward here, and I've confirmed those words, and things are done in decency and order. People with this gift see biblical truth that others often fail to see and challenge them to respond. You see, a gift of prophecy is to sharpen. Iron sharpens iron. The prophecy, the word of prophecy comes into a community, into a city, into Jerusalem, into Israel, into a kingdom, to Hezekiah, to Ahaz, to Ahab. And it's to expose and to challenge biblical truth for the uplifting for the exhortation, for the betterment of the body of Messiah. P 
People with this gift warn of God's immediate or future judgment if there is no repentance. How many times in the Word of God have we heard the words spoken by the prophet? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, if my people will turn away from their wooden idols and from their Asherah poles, if my people will come worship me on this holy mountain, then I will forgive them. I will restore them. I will bring rain in its season and their crops will bear fruit. This is the role of the prophecy coming from God. And people with this gift understand God's heart and mind through experiences that the Lord takes them through. We know of many, many prophets in the Bible, many who stood out there by themselves, because for those with the gift of prophecy, sometimes it's a lonely, lonely, lonely role. Seldom understood and often feared, often rejected. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 to 21, and we have the word of the prophets made more certain, and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This is one of the tests of a prophecy as to whether or not it lines up with the Scripture. It can't be of your own doing. Now, if I want to give a word of prophecy, thus says Rabbi Eric, that would be different. But when you put on there the tagline, thus says the Lord, it cannot be of your own words. It is so true that prophecy does not proceed from human reasoning, learning, education, or seminary training. Like all the other gifts, prophecy only comes by the supernatural operation of the Holy Spirit. Now on the day of Pentecost, on Shavuot, the Apostle Peter said to the crowds, In the last day God says, I will pour out my Spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. In those days I will pour out my Spirit even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy, Acts chapter 2. You know, it's important for us to understand that in these days, we should see an increase in prophecy. We should hear more prophecy, because as we get closer to the coming of Messiah, God is speaking through those who are anointed and who have received the gift of prophecy. God is doing exactly what He said He would do in the last days. He's pouring out His Spirit on all people. Every section of the human race, without exception, is going to experience this last day visitation of the Holy Spirit. Prophecy is particularly emphasized in this passage. In these last days, God's people everywhere are going to have restored to them a beautiful but controversial manifestation of prophesying. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 3 and 4, the Apostle Paul laid down the basic purposes and functions of the gift of prophecy. He said, but he who prophesies speaks edification an exhortation, and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the congregation. Now, there are different categories within there. There's edification, there's exhortation, there's comfort. It can also be predictive, it can be rebuking, it can be directed. And we need to understand what that means, because it's hard to figure out with all the people on television, and all the emails coming out, and all these future predictions. Is that prophecy? Is that the gift of prophecy? Is that man's interpretation? Is that a book written? Is it somebody reading the signs of the times and evaluating and predicting? Is it a combination of Kabbalah? Is it a combination of numerology? Is it a little bit of scripture and a lot of opinion? Is it wisdom? Is it training? Is it teaching? Do we sit under? Do we get a degree, a diploma? Can I go to a school? Or is this a supernatural gift of the Holy Spirit? And if it's a supernatural gift of the Holy Spirit, like every other gift, God does not call the qualified, He qualifies the called. God will give the gift of prophecy to whom God chooses according to His Word. And we have a number in this congregation with the gift of prophecy, and if you don't know who they are, that's a testimony. 
Because part of this gift is the responsibility of knowing when God will release you to impart His Word. Whether or not it's a valid word, whether or not it's something that is predictive, and whether or not it's something that is verifiable. Because God honors His gifts. Words of edification build up the hearer. To edify simply means to build up or strengthen. It means to make people more effective as members of the body of Messiah in whatever particular ministries they have. So if somebody brings you a word of the Lord, the Lord gave me a word for you. Be strong. Be courageous. Hang in there, buddy. The Lord wants you to know He loves you for the edification, for building up, because you look discouraged, you look downtrodden. And I sought the Lord, and He heard me. And he told me to tell you, he loves you. He'll never leave you or forsake you. Well, you say, Rabbi, well, that's just Scripture. Yes, God speaks to us in Scripture so that we know that it's from him because he's already said it. And he says you can point to it, and that's how you know it's from me. If you receive the gift of prophecy, then it should make you better able to serve the Lord and his people. Now, words of exhortation motivate and renew the spirit of the hearer. It means to stimulate, to encourage, to admonish, and to stir up. It does not include condemnation. Romans 8 and 1, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who, are, those who are Messiah. We do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the Spirit. And words of comfort do just that. They comfort the hearer. It means to cheer up. Predictive words foretell things in the future. Words of rebuke point out sin and extend a call to repentance. This is in accordance with what the Scripture says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, in verses 16 and 17. All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip His people to do every good work. Directive words are those which give guidance to the hearer concerning some action or decision, often relating to immediate or, or, or the near future. How many of you say, you know, Rabbi, I'm pondering a decision. I'd like you to pray about it. You come to me and you ask me to pray about it, expecting an answer. Well, Rabbi, did you, did you pray about that? I did. Well, what did you hear? What did you learn? What did, you, what did God show you? Well, that's acknowledging the gift of prophecy. It's acknowledging that what you want to hear is something directed towards your circumstance, your situation. Now, if you say, what is your advice? What is your counsel? That's different. I'll give you advice and counsel. We can do it right there on the spot. But if you ask me to pray about it and seek the Lord about it, you'll hear from me when I have something to deliver. You'll hear from me when the message comes through, if it comes through. And if it comes through, only then if I'm released to share it. And that's part of the job, part of the gift. And it's hard to sometimes to distinguish between the gift of prophecy and the office of the prophet. Because the office of the prophet is specifically within the congregation, someone who keeps the congregation on track. Someone who sits in the office of the prophet hears specifically about the congregation at large. The direction, the challenges, which way it's going. Is it getting soft? Is it getting hard? Is it walking in love? Is it not walking in love? If it's following false teaching, to pull it back on track. Many congregational leaders don't want anybody in that office. Because if the congregation is going astray, the body goes where the head leads them. So goes the head, so goes the body. So if the office of the prophet is doing his job, he's keeping me straight. And if he's keeping me straight, it's a trickle down. It keeps the congregation straight and accountable. Prophecy and the mature prophet are very precious gifts to the congregation, but the gift of prophecy is also the most easily misunderstood and misused gift. Because of its very nature, it becomes very necessary to judge every prophecy or prophetic utterance in order to know the spirit that's at work. Are you saying there's more than one spirit at work? Yes, oh yes, and the Word of God tells us that not always is it the Spirit of God. You know, if there's an authentic, there's going to be a counterfeit. If there's a Messiah, there's going to be an anti-Messiah. If there's an angel of light, there's going to be an angel of darkness. It's the way it works in God's economy. There's always a counterfeit if there's an authentic. Now, usually when a prophetic utterance comes forth in an assembly, a holy quiet falls over the congregation. It's happened here. 
It may happen here again tonight. A word was passed to me. It may happen, and if I ask for this word to be brought forward, you will all have this hush. As you should, if it's from the Lord. There's the assumption that God is speaking to His congregation, but if the truth is, it may not be God who is speaking. And in many assemblies, it's not. In this assembly, I pray each and every time before I get up here that it is. And then if a word comes forward the way we do it here, I get to see the word. I get to confirm the word. Let the spirit of the prophet be subject to the prophet. Now the Bible teaches that there's, there's three sources of prophecy. The first source is God through the Holy Spirit in 2 Peter 1 and 21. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The second source is the human spirit or soul. This is what the Lord Almighty says in Jeremiah 23, 16. Do not listen to what the prophets are prophesying to you. They fill you with false hopes. They speak visions from their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. Source number two. Source number three, satanic or demonic spirits in Jeremiah 23, 13. Among the prophets of Samaria, I saw this repulsive thing. They prophesied by Baal and led my people Israel astray. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. The three sources. And we must test every source. If a word is brought forward, we must test the source and test the Spirit. Now, there will always be spiritually less mature people in a congregation, spiritually more mature. We're all at different levels, as we should be. Before I knew something, I knew nothing. Now that I know nothing, I hope to know more. God's not finished with any one of us. Many who hear prophetic words and do not know of the three sources tend to receive every word spoken as from the Lord. And we all need to be protected from prophetic error. It's for our protection that prophecy is to be judged and tested. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 13 to 15, for such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, masquerading as apostles of Messiah. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising then if his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. Scripture admonishes us to test prophecy. The Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5, 21 and 22 said, but test everything that is said, hold on to what is good and keep away from all evil. Do not accept all prophecies as coming from God and being relevant, true and authoritative without question. Test it and retain what is good and stay away from what is evil. When you eat fish, you eat the flesh, but you don't swallow the bones. Do the same thing with prophesying. Eat the meat, but don't harm yourself trying to swallow the bones. The Apostle John also spoke about testing prophecy in 1 John 4 and 1. Dear friends, do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. You must test them to see if the Spirit they have comes from God, for there are many false prophets in the world. When you test prophecy, you're not testing the prophet as an individual, but you're testing the Spirit that is speaking through the prophet. And it's important that we understand that. Don't be offended if what you say to me is tested. Oh, he doesn't believe me. He's challenging me, not challenging you. In every one of the teachings here, I challenge you to go to the Word of God. And if it doesn't line up with the Word of God, it does not line up. If you cannot stand on the foundation of the Word of God, you cannot stand. And if what you say is contrary to what is in here, in the literal Word of God, from Genesis to Revelation, it will not take hold in this congregation as long as I'm standing up here. Amen? Amen? amen. amen. I want to hear some amens. Amen. We're warned there are many false prophets who have gone out into the world with false spirits operating through them. The Apostle John also drew the distinction between the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. 1 John 4 and 6 tells us we are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. There is a spirit of error, and it will sometimes seek to impart error disguised as prophecy. 
In fact, we have heard people trying to sustain false doctrine by manipulating prophecy. It's obvious that their whole purpose in prophesying was to get people to swallow a doctrine that they were trying to put across. Now, I have in my office that perfect Bible that I've shown many of you. It's called the Pick and Choose Translation. All the pages are blank. And you just pick and choose whatever scriptures you want, and you write them in there to use at your convenience. And prophecy is often handled like that when there's a motivation. Now, does that mean that I think all of it is a bunch of bunk? Absolutely not. Do I think that there are prophets today? Absolutely. Do I think that the word of prophecy is coming forth in more volume than it's ever had since 2,000 years ago? I absolutely believe it is. But because there's so much, and it's so profitable, and everybody has a book, and everybody has a TV program, and everybody has a video and a feature and this, we have to look at the truth and the validity and the fruit. You see, is it judgment or is it fruit inspection? Because I know each one of you, when you go to the fruit stand in the grocery store, you pick up the cantaloupe and you press it, and you smell it, and you make sure. It doesn't make you a farmer, doesn't make you a critic, doesn't make you a horticulturalist, it just makes you a fruit inspector. Let's not get so super spiritual. Oh, you're being judgmental, Rabbi. No, I'm being a fruit inspector because God's Word tells me to be a fruit inspector. Now, we have to look at the criteria for testing prophecy. One is fulfillment. The simplest test of the prophet is to examine his teaching and to note if he said anything of a predictive manner. And if he did, then the simplest test of fulfillment could be applied. Did what the prophets say would happen actually take place? Simple. If you predicted the end of the world in 1988... You were a false prophet. That's pretty simple. Now, am I attacking the person? No, I'm attacking the prophecy. Okay? You got your information wrong. Right? Now, that person that promoted the theory that the world was coming to an end in 1988, I'm sure that he adjusted his calculations, and he's now coming up with the belief that God moved to the Mayan calendar because he didn't like the calendar that he created. So he moved to the Mayan calendar in 2012 would be the end of the world. Maybe it will be. Or maybe God was a Y6K God and for 6,000 years of a day is like 1,000 years to the Lord. Maybe at the end of this 5,771 years when we get to Y6K. Who knows? Or maybe there's a missing 230 years and maybe we're there. I don't know, but I know I'm supposed to be about my father's business until he comes. So when the master comes, I'm not asleep, I'm not drunk, and I'm not beating the servants. Did what the prophets say would happen take place? This is the test advocated in Deuteronomy 18.22. If what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not play, take place or come true, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. That's pretty obvious. So you have to look at these things, and you have to look at history and historical track records. Now, what's interesting is, of one of today's most accurate prophets, tells you he's not a prophet, he's an author. I'm just a man that writes novels. That's all I know. Where do you get your novels from? Well, the Lord gives them to me, but I don't want to put on there, thus says the Lord, because when I predicted there'll be a black president five years ago, I predicted that in my book, not me, but the author. Or when I said that the next jihad would come, well, the Lord showed me that, and now I've written another book, The Twelfth Imam, and now we're seeing the Mahdi starting to show up in different places. And so he says he's not a prophet, but his accuracy has been impeccable. God cannot lie, and if the prophet declares God has said something which did not play, take place, clearly he has not spoken the word of God. Now, Deuteronomy 13, chapter 1 through 3 says, If a prophet or one who foretells by dreams appears among you and announces to you a miraculous sign or wonder, and if the sign or wonder of which he has spoken takes place and he says, Let us follow other gods, gods you have not known, and let us worship them, you must not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer. The Lord your God is testing you to find out whether you love, you love him with all your heart and with all your soul. Because prophecy from God promotes obedience to God. It doesn't take you down a different path. It doesn't take you to, to sorcerers and to, to uh, 
Dionne Warwick. What was that? Uh, psychic Hotline. Doesn't send you down that path. It doesn't send you to communicate with the dead. God's not the God of the dead, is He? According to the Word of God, He's the God of the living. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 3 through 4, Rabbi Shaul, Paul the Apostle, laid down the basic purpose and functions of the gift of prophecy. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the congregation. There is a time when God does rebuke and chasten his people. There is a place for this, but it's never his last word. And even through the prophet Jeremiah, the Lord commissioned to be a prophet, saying, I ordained you a prophet to the nations, I have put my word in your mouth. See, I have this day set you over the kingdoms to root out and to pull, to destroy and to throw down, but to build and to plant. You see, God's final word is not destruction and death. God's final word is life. It's always for life. But in God's economy, sometimes we have to tear away our old. And the old has to die. And our old ways have to die. And God will use the gift of prophecy to speak that into someone's life. But death and destruction is never his final word through the prophet. It's life and it's growth. It's for your betterment to give you new life. That new life that God promises. Another test is whether the prophecy agrees with Scripture. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, 2 Timothy 3.16. The authority behind all Scripture is the Holy Spirit, and He will never contradict Himself. Anything given in prophecy, therefore, will never be opposed to the letter of the Scripture. So if you want to know if prophecy is real, it's got to line up. If it doesn't line up with the Word of God, it does not line up. If the teaching doesn't line up with the Word of God, it does not line up. If you will stand for nothing, you'll fall for anything. What's that old line? If you give the enemy an inch, he'll become your ruler. Paul wrote about the consistency of God's Word when he declared in 2 Corinthians 1.17, Do I make plans in a worldly manner? So in the same breath, I say yes, yes, and no, no. But as surely as God is faithful, our message to you is not yes and no. For the Son of God, Messiah Yeshua, who is preached among you by me, and Silas and Timothy was not yes and no, but in Him it has always been yes. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Messiah. In other words, God does not contradict Himself. And we're to look at the, at the fruit as Yeshua specifically warned us in Matthew 7, 15, and 16. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? He wants us to be a fruit inspector. And He wants us to look at this gift of prophecy and he wants us to understand in Revelation 19 and 10 when John wrote, And I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Yeshua. Worship God, for the testimony of Yeshua is the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Yeshua is the spirit of prophecy. This gift of prophecy is a powerful one. This gift of prophecy will take you to places, places with God that no other gift can give you. You'll hear His voice. He'll give you authority to speak His words that will be life-changing and life-giving. For every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God is for life-giving. But let me caution you. It's not for your own agenda. It's for not for you to parlay into manipulation or to gain favor or to be used in such a way as to cause an outcome that would be self-serving. For a word of prophecy and the gift of prophecy is never for the benefit of one except 
the one, the body of Messiah. It's a special gift, a higher gift. A gift reserved for those who know the Messiah, for those who can be trusted. For like every gift that comes from God, there comes a condition that you know Him. That you've taken that step toward Him away from the world and what the world has to offer because you want that new life that comes only in Him. And He has these gifts available. We're 15, 16 weeks into studying these gifts. We're coming on close to the end of this series. And each one of you has a gift, and if you don't know what that gift is, I encourage you. But if you don't think you have any gift, if you have no fulfillment in your life, then maybe the question for you isn't what gift is for you, but have you made a commitment to the Messiah? Have you made that step of repentance, that step of turning from the life you're leading to the life God has for you? turning away from what the world has to give you and being willing to accept what God has for you. Even the longest journey in life begins with a a single step. And that first step in God's kingdom is to say yes to the Messiah. That first step is to say, Lord, I'm sorry that I've sinned against you. I'm sorry whether it's been through my mouth or through my mind or through my actions or it's been through adultery or it's through murder or slander or strife or anger or negative thinking or evil speaking or lying or gossiping, worshiping money, jealousy, anger, wrath, strife, all those things. If I haven't blessed those that curse me, if I haven't loved my neighbor, if I haven't put you first, Lord, in my life, then I've sinned against you. Oh, it's not a matter of, oh, I'm a murderer, I'm a bank robber. The Word of God says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God has a promise. He spoke to us through that great prophet Isaiah. He said, your sins were once red as crimson, but now they're white as snow. And I want that in my life. I want my sins to be white as snow. I want to walk in that forgiveness. That even if I stumble, I can never fall. That no one can take me out of the hand of the Father. No one. The Word of God tells me that. But in order to take that place right there in the hand of the Father, I have to come to Him through the blood of the Son. I have to accept His plan of atonement, His plan of salvation, His plan of forgiveness. And the way I do that is I say with my mouth and in my heart, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I've sinned against you. And I ask Yeshua, Jesus, into my heart. And I believe that he died for my sins. And the third day he rose again. And now he's sitting at the right hand of the Father and he's sitting for me. And because he lives, I can live now and forevermore. And if you're here tonight and you don't have that in your life, you don't have a relationship with the Messiah, you don't have those gifts that He promises to give you when you're born again, born of the Spirit, I want to give you an opportunity to receive that gift. The first gift, the gift of forgiveness, the gift of salvation. And if you've never said that prayer before, I want to give you the opportunity to do it. You say, Rabbi, I'm Jewish. Well, yes, I'm Jewish too, and I said that prayer. As he came for us, he's the Jewish Messiah. You say, I'm not Jewish. Well, he came for you too. Yes, for all of mankind. For God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son. Whoever believed in him would not perish, but would have eternal life. If you've never said that prayer before, just slip up your hand. Doesn't matter how old you are, young or old. Doesn't matter what church you go to or where you were raised or what you were taught. If you cannot profess Your faith in Messiah before man, he cannot profess you before the Father in heaven. It's just that simple. So if you're here tonight and you've never said that prayer before, just slip up your hand and I'll pray that prayer with you. Is there anybody here tonight that would like to say that prayer for the first time? 
Is there anybody? Just slip up your hand. All right, let's stand to our feet. Father, I ask you tonight to make your presence made known in this place, Father. I ask that this word come forward, Lord. This word that comes from you, Father God. This question that you've asked. For the word of the Lord came forth to me this night with this question. Where are you with me, my people? Where are you with me? There's one thing that is sure in this hour. You must know my word. You must be able to be identified as those people who can stand on my word. Who is it that will teach my word? It is a person of small stature. One who is unworthy, but I have made him worthy. One who recognizes their limitations, but I have made them go beyond those limitations. One with my anointing. One who seeks no glory for themselves. One who teaches the Word and stays with the Word, and only, only with my Word, my people. This is the hour, if you only knew how close it was For my son to return to you, you would be making yourselves ready. Do not be like the brides that did not make themselves ready. They reveled in the world. But when I came and the trumpet sounded, they wanted to go get oil here and there, but there was none to spare. Oh, my people, this is the hour you must be prepared This is the hour that you must know that you can stand on something stable. For my word is the only thing that is stable in this hour. The world is in a very unstable position. Do not, do not listen to those who bring glory to themselves. But listen to my spirit through my anointed servants that have humbled themselves and have made themselves of no repute. Oh, my people, listen to me in this hour through the servants who are proclaiming my word that you may be able to stand, having done all to stand, saith the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's another word come forth in this congregation. Bring it forward. If you have a word from the Lord and you're willing to stand the test, to allow that gift of prophecy to operate in you this night and you have a message for this congregation, bring it forward right now. Bring it forward. Raise your hand and I'll call upon you. Is it here? Is it here? Amen. Amen. You have a word for this congregation. Oh, the, do you want to say the, the prayer of salvation? Okay, wonderful. Praise God. Praise God. See, God's moving in this place. God is moving in this place. God is moving in this place. To say this prayer with me. Let him say the prayer. Let him say the prayer. All right, and we're going to say it with you just to encourage you. Tell me your name. Uh, Jimmy. Jimmy. Well, Jimmy, I want you just to say this prayer. Lord, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I've sinned against you. I'm sorry I've sinned against you. And I ask Yeshua, I ask Yeshua. Jesus, into my heart. Jesus into my heart. And I believe that he died for me. And he took my sins upon himself. He took my sins upon himself. And that he rose again on the third day. He rose again on the third day. And he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. Interceding for me. Interceding for me. And because he lives. Because he lives. I can live. I can live. 
and be forgiven, be forgiven. This, night this night and forevermore. The angels are rejoicing in heaven. It's the best decision you've ever made in your life. God bless you. God bless you. We have our son of Zion come up now as we get ready to close our service with the Kiddush and the Hamot.